this session. This meeting is being recorded. Hello. Good morning in America and good evening in India. Namaskar. I'm Dr. Mrunalini Radkar um, from Texas, USA, and the founder of Setu International Foundation. And also, I'm a medical director at Cal West Regional um, Local Here Hospital. Um, so thank you, really. Uh, we are very honored for you all joining for this webinar. Uh, taking time off from your long weekend. It's a 4th of July weekend in America. Happy Independence Day to America here. Um, so, uh, but taking your time off, a uh, time from your um, uh, busy long weekend and joining us for important topic. We are very honored to have uh, Dr. Gurupur uh, here give, uh, as a, uh, going to be giving us a webinar um, and uh, so Setu International Foundation, we are, we have founded this uh, foundation with a mission uh, to bridge the inequality that we see and inequality divide by providing socio-emotional, educational and technological resources to underserved community. And what our vision is to, um, we, have, our, our, we would like to see the world where every human being is given equal opportunity and uh, is, uh, is e every human being achieves the, the potential that they have inside of them so that the opportunities are given and that's what our vision is. Um, so having said that, we are very honored to have Dr. Shashikala Gurupur. Uh, she is a Jean Monet Chair Professor Fulbright Scholar, um, Director of um, Symbiosis Law School, Dean of Symbiosis International University in Pune. Uh, she has done a PhD in international law and uh, uh, she has received um, multiple awards, uh, gold medal. So awesome. Please mute yourself, please. Um, try to mute yourself. Huh? Please mute, please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, I would, I'm going to request all of you to please mute yourself. Um, so. Brunal, you, can, you yes. can just go ahead as a host and mute everybody. No, hold on. Okay. Oh, here we go. Um, so, um, so we are, um, she has received multiple awards, gold medals, and uh, consider top 100 uh, legal luminaries in, uh, in legal profession. Also, um, she's also a poet too, uh, has written law books and chapters in the books. And so we are really um, honored to have her. Uh, and give us a time and give us a guidance in very important topic. At Setu's mission, we are working with children's education. Uh, that's what our focus is. Um, one of the focus is children uh, education. We do mentoring also. And uh, women empowerment is, is our third pillar, but we are concentrating on children's education. So what uh, the today's topic is responsible conduct regarding vulnerable uh, in uh, with emphasis on children's legal rights. So without any further delay, I would, um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Shachikala Gurupur to join, um, to start the webinar. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Dr. Uh, Radkar. Uh, I have been very privileged to be speaker for Setu. Uh, at this outset, I would like to thank uh, our colleague, Dr. Shirish Kulkarni, who introduced uh, the two of us. And I thank you for being so open to the idea of bringing the legal dimension and the rights dimension into the discourses, uh, which is predominantly otherwise into uh, healthcare. Uh, and being a doctor and being in a very lead position, uh, the understanding of healthcare justice that you have is really admirable. And I'm sure that your board also has 
similar uh, uh, valued kind of people, people with similar values. I think we don't come together otherwise to work together. It's not easy. Uh, I welcome one and all uh, who have assembled here, some of my friends like uh, and colleagues like Dr. Ashish, uh, probably Dr. Shirish is there somewhere. All the board members and uh, well-wishers and workers of Setu in the grassroots and other places. Uh, other legal uh, luminaries and uh, friends like uh, Mr. Hemraj who leads an organization in Bangalore. There are many. So welcome one and all. Uh, let me share my PowerPoint presentation uh, because I need to keep time and uh, there is a structure that I need to follow. So uh, permit me to uh, play this. Uh, I think I have to, uh, yeah. So that is the thing. So uh, today's talk is going to be, uh, as it is already told, uh, it's a responsible conduct towards the vulnerable and we are looking at children as a case in point. Uh, that presupposes a concept called vulnerability. How do we identify vulnerability or understand vulnerability? People use the word vulnerable in many contexts, uh, in contexts where you become more emotional, soft towards someone, or you become um, helpless in many ways. But vulnerability as a word is derived from a Latin word called vulnus, which means to wound. So in the, in the embodiment, it means harm and suffering. So it has a physical connotation. And if you look at the dimension of vulnerability, there's a particular dimension of an individual feeling the harm or suffering. And there's a universal commonness to it. So one of the law scholars, Mary Healy said, I'm vulnerable because I depend on others' cooperation and because I'm open. Now this word open means that you don't have your safety nets. You are either by situation or by some kind of unique biological characteristics or other kinds of characteristics is open uh, without any guard. So if you go further, uh, in a broader sense, the word vulnerability means susceptibility to harm, susceptibility to disease, to exploitation, and in the ultimate form, susceptibility to death. That means vulnerability has got a social dimension. It has got, a, it has got an economic dimension. In the social dimension, particularly in case of communitarian societies like India, reputation can be that. Even in advanced countries, social vulnerability comes from attack on reputation. It could be a political vulnerability as well. Economic vulnerability is in the form of what Chambers calls as the, the vulnerability in terms of multiple dimensions of poverty. Psychological vulnerability, bodily, moral, institutional vulnerability because you are not in a powerful position in a given institution. So one of the lead scholars in the vulnerability studies comes from this chair which is hosted in Atlanta. Uh, Martha Feynman, one of the lead feminists, she talks about quality and quantity of resources which we possess or we command determine our vulnerability. Just imagine the case of somebody who is uh, differently abled as far as mental faculties are concerned. Now, what kind of resources this person can possess? Can that person enjoy those resources, control those resources, command them, or uh, uh, can enhance them? You can't conceive this possibility. Such a person is always open, dependent on others, therefore open to exploitation, right? So another scholar, Coleman says, even if there's no consensus, nobody agrees, no two scholars think same of vulnerability because they come from different practical operational realities and theories. Yeah. Uh, it calls for protecting. I mean, all of them are unanimous in the sense that uh, it calls for protecting the vulnerable. Uh, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing which has ethical appeal in all disciplines, whether it is medicine or it is law or it is social sciences or psychiatry or psychological sciences. Therefore, it is something that needs the protection. And if there's no such protection, it could continue. Such susceptibility to harm could continue. Therefore, in our innovation, in our growth, in our relationship, in our connectedness to others, in our empathy, in our experience of pleasure, in our intimacy, and in our social institutions like family, community, schools, 
colleges this idea of vulnerability and sensitivity to vulnerability of ourselves and others our situation also changing into a vulnerable situation in a particular way i'll give you examples is something that gives us an opportunity to rethink the whole situation and vulnerability should not be seen as a suffering in a negative sense it should be seen as an opportunity for the rest of us who are not suffering to reconceptualize it in a positive way if somebody is vulnerable then what's my responsibility do i only loathe and write about it and take pleasure in terms of you know serving my itch to empathize and express and indirectly feel that ego satisfaction no vulnerability is about an opportunity for us to feel the vulnerability of the other person and thereby looking at how we can support that person i'm going to this context of vulnerability rather than our law and justice alone where we swing into action in the constitution we talk about positive discrimination so we talk about eliminating discrimination but when it comes to protecting the situation <laughs> Please, whoever it is, can you mute yourself, please? I don't agree. Before you, yeah, uh, it's really interfering. Thank you for understanding. So, uh, in a constitutional context, we have a concept of positive discrimination, which means that although equality per se, in the strict sense, prohibits any kind of favorable treatment to anybody, and treating equals as equals. and unequals as unequals if it is the question of vulnerability which is not defined in the constitution but special categories of people then the discrimination is positive because state provides for providing special opportunities for such categories of people or citizens so vulnerability as a concept if you see it has got a kind of versatility and uh, if there is a dignity and respect in case of an individual they become less vulnerable the less dignity uh, and uh, the, the more is the violation of the right of a person the more is the lack of dignity the more is the possibility of vulnerability this is something that i want to set a stage before we continue further therefore human rights always put in the center the dignity and non violation of such dignity or right to integrity of her whether physical psychological or moral and not exploiting their vulnerability and this is intrinsic to every individual social and environmental condition so many a times when we in a mega sense when we plan projects we forget the vulnerable people or we are not sensitive to their special situation only when there is harm to life and sometimes it may not be visible harm it may be invisible trauma doctor will bail me out in terms of disorders which come as post traumatic uh, experiences and uh, we would have seen it in the post covid scenario i was reading hundreds of reports talking about how post covid recovery in the psychological sense for all categories including children because they were glued to the screen they were deprived of social interaction for months together but we have yet to come out with a white paper on specially dealing with this situation as a, as a nation or as a world or as a human kind so uh, how long are we waiting for this so what are the what are the intrinsic situations of vulnerability which is created to the individual society and environmental conditions because uh, we had the recent uh, international conference and we were talking about greening in the post covid period or green sensitivity in the post covid reconstruction of the world so there we have to be more uh, sensitive to those who have been now pushed to the bracket of poverty with the probably less than 1.5 dollars a day to live on so uh, from that point of view if you see vulnerable groups have multiply uh, deprived or disadvantaged sections like women and girls children refugees indigenous people migrant workers disabled persons elderly people uh, hiv positive persons and aids victims stateless persons internally displaced people because of uh, riots because of internal wars and strifes we see that in many countries 
or it could be people who are displaced because their means of living has been usurped by someone else or because of the policies which have been blind to their reality national minorities and lgbtq population now it's not an exhaustive list this list may vary from place to place and in case of australia also the court has pointed out uh, if there is if there is a lack of care uh, in case of a medically vulnerable population like uh, we have had a student who was hemophilic he was particularly vulnerable so we we got used to the way in which we could accommodate as an institution this child fortunately for us now he is pursuing phd with our institution because of the treatment he received during uh, his post graduation course uh, people think that india doesn't have hemophilic cases but we do have rarely such cases so in such medically vulnerable popula population how do we prioritize them and another medically vulnerable population is the elderly population elder residents in our country how do we see them therefore uh, vulnerability as such is a kind of condition where the effects of a hostile environment is difficult to be withstood by these people and they may be either attacked or they may be harmed or, uh, and this attack or harm may not be always physical it could also be emotional therefore when we are looking at protecting the rights of this vulnerable population we have to look at those who may get discriminated or neglected or exploited because of situations such as homelessness or rurality living in remote areas illiteracy because they are not able to articulate or talk about what they want speaking in a non mainstream dialect sometimes based on accents or based on lack of communication shin skills in english somebody might not be able to feel the what uh, uh, dr uh, mrinalini just now highlighted feel that actualization of rights or actualization of the being hidden groups sometimes people have to hide their identity we have had cases of lgbtq people uh, till we passed the legislation and till there was an open acceptance thanks to the social media and yoga karta and other principles at the international level and indian incumbency supporting these movements and being sensitive to them uh, we have had open communication but till then there were cases of parents disowning such children at the young age this uh, boys or girls falling to the street and things like that and then getting into uh, a very very dangerous kind of lifestyle and means of living societal discrimination due to cultural or social practices which could be because of uh, you know exclusion or uh, racialized or religious groups even indigenous population i have grown up watching these practices inhuman indignation kind of practices where people are kept outside somebody's house uh, at the corner of the uh, front yard or they have been uh, uh, targets of rituals which make them take take the evil of people so a legislation was passed when i was a student prohibiting such practices as offenses criminal offenses so this is our understanding now when we are dealing with this vulnerable population coming to its relevance to doctors or its relevance to researchers or non governmental organizations or counselors who are or social workers who are intervening uh or who are researching who are teaching in schools and non school settings who are parents who are dealing with such a vulnerable population general and then i come to the particular case of children uh if you look at the policy the policy uh, has got lot of framework we have got uh, uh, northern european uh, uh, ethical guidelines on social sciences and humanities research unicef's ethical research in case of children Uh, which came in uh, i mean there were repeated versions coming in 2014 2019 if i can summarize the principles first is respect their dignity don't violate their privacy inform them before you obtain their consent and then their consent has to be obtained after prior information and there is an obligation to notify them of the risks involved notify them Uh, uh of the consequences of participating here i'll give you examples confidentiality not to reveal the names protecting their data and then uh, restricting reuse of that data without their consent 
uh, I'll tell you, I'll give you two examples in this case, preventing any kind of harm, particularly protecting the children and respecting their welfare, respecting them as individuals or entities who have all legal rights and justice. Now, the first example I can give you is of this uh, example cited from Uganda. When the social workers were working in Uganda on uh, nutrition, I mean, they were health workers and doctors and interdisciplinary team. Now, all the family members were invited in these areas where malnourishment was reported. You know, Uganda went through a kind of uh, political upheaval. So wherever, I mean, we say that uh, that whole network of factors resulting in poverty and vulnerability has got politics as an important factor. Therefore, it's very important we exercise our rights as citizens in a proper way and participate in debates and give our views and opinions through the platforms. So what happened in Uganda was when all these children were invited who were malnourished, they were discussing. Suddenly one child comes out with an information that I always go to bed without my dinner. When he was, when it was probed, when he was asked deeply, he gives the response that he cannot bear the pain of his mother being beaten by his drunken father. So this reveals that there is prevalence of domestic violence, which also contributes as a factor. This is why we, when we talk about rights discourse, we can't disconnect these things. Violence as a situation resulting in violation of rights of peaceful uh, equilibrium situation of justice in the home front, in the private sphere. Now, if this child was talking in between other children of the neighborhood, what are the risks that child will be uh, exposed to? Uh, what kind of intervention should the social worker make? What kind of documentation should be there? And uh, how do you make an intervention in the family to prevent that situation from recurring and to protect that child? So in these cases, it is always advised that don't keep children in a group, always keep them individually. And when the children are to communicate to you, always keep a child social worker, child psychiatric social worker, not ordinary social worker, child psychiatric social worker with you so that the way you ask questions and the way the child has to recall his or her trauma should not result in revisiting the trauma. And then you have to keep this data anonymized, reduced to numbers, not the name of the child. And you should prevent this data from falling into any hand because if there is a gossip in that neighborhood and if the father wants to know when did this child say, did the child say, or if it falls in father's ears, you can imagine the consequences. So this is responsible conduct as a social worker, as a researcher. Now, the second example I can give restricting the reuse and protecting the data is a kind of research we did in my home state about uh, 10,000 uh, uh, female sex workers we had to interview to make policy propositions uh, for ameliorating their conditions. What we realized among this 10,000 sample and then 3,000 qualitative interview was that 45% of them were trafficked as children. So when we asked them, there was one question in the questionnaire, where you trafficked as a child? The answer was very difficult for them. I mean, can you recall which year, at what age did this happen? We were very insensitive when we interviewed the first one. Then we brought the, I mean, I read the guidelines again and again, international guidelines, and we brought the psychiatric social worker because this particular person who is in her 30s, she suddenly, uh, uh, we could see her developing a kind of swelling in the throat and fidgety body. And she asked for a glass of water and she said, I'll tell you tomorrow. So we could, be, we could see her obvious trauma recalling. Then we had to talk to psychiatric social workers and next day she revealed all the details and then we stopped interviewing others about this question. So uh, they just had to say at what age you came, approximately 14, 15, this is how we got the numbers. Therefore, when you look at this condition, it is very clear that there's a lot of sensitivity that we have to have. In the Indian context, we have in vulnerability, uh, children who are abuse victims or abuse survivors. Uh, we have uh, SCST minority in certain segments uh, in the economic sense, differently abled senior citizens, 
victims of substance abuse you know they could be vulnerable as well because of the addiction sick illiterate unorganized workers migrants and internally displaced people people uh, living i mean more or less the global categorization and indian categorization match but in indian context there could be a few more uh, vulnerabilities which could come particularly because of human trafficking poverty and other vulnerabilities being there so some of you doctors and other experts who are working with such groups uh, when you are researching on children or young adolescents it's very important that you may gather information before delivering the schemes or developing a project on them uh, but uh, when you gather such information you have to be mindful that they could be more vulnerable as the example i gave you and you have to seek their views also but try to do it in uh, such a way that their abuse of experience is handled with the utmost sensitivity to their psychological makeup and then uh, we may do these interviews we may take their stories we may give them pictures and provoke them to write about it or talk about it we may tape them we may have a focus group but please be mindful of the kind of examples i told you you may even go to the extent of testing the biological sample so in ethics committees it is always emphasized at the university level and in the ngo also it's very important to have external ethical advisor so that you take a very uh, considered neutral objective impartial efficient decisions which do not risk your work or organization of attracting any kind of human rights violation particularly in terms of the vulnerable because they are the voiceless and they are very much uh, as we said invisible and unheard of therefore uh, Uh, USAID long ago one of the funding agencies internationally spoke about uh, a source of information and principles and while doing so the responsibility to uncover sometimes you may get a half story for example we were visiting our ex ex expansion work in some villages uh, we wanted to give just basic legal literacy to the school kids and suddenly we came with stories of someone abusing them at home in the neighborhood or in the school itself so you cannot ever judge a child by that child's appearance a child may be running deep you know they say that uh, there is a there is a very important uh, poet's uh, expression khalil gibran children are uh, life's gift to itself and they are not your children they are life's gift to itself and uh, they you are only the bow and they are the arrows of uh, the world in the sense that a child may look very uh normal a child may look very naughty and the way we understand children is very important therefore here minimizing the risk adhering to guidelines understanding that we are powerful in front of the child i mean there is always that tom and jerry going on between us and the children i have always asked every child whom do you like they always said jerry they identify themselves as jerry because they feel that tom is always authoritative who knows they may be looking at us teachers as jerry's parents as jerry's therefore taking taking their opinion engaging them is important never underestimate a child as someone who is docile someone who is not having that whole consciousness formed and today's child is much more so who is more competent than us in technology and therefore knowing the ways of the world but then today's child is doubly vulnerable because of that the technological vulnerability for the children uh, even in the ordinary sense especially during covid 19 context we had multiple vulnerabilities identified in the school context also that children were exposed to intruders in the online children were exposed to uh, some kind of uh, uh, unwanted kind of invitations some of them became victims of pubg and all other kinds of blue whale kinds of uh, online games and by the time these cyber offenses were detected many children had become traumatized or victims uh, pushed into suicide as well in some cases or lured into abusive situations in the nearby hotel or somewhere for a tea and then that leading to abduction so and another situation is uh, parents being abusive to children domestic violence cases being reported where child felt uh, we call it a secondary victimization when the child saw the parent being abused or the child itself being abused physically or emotionally therefore the principles in law when they look at the rights of children is best interest of the child what is best interest depends from context to context however the best interest the very word right is nothing but interest which is recognized by the law formulated by the law so best interest is 
the duty that we have to the child which defines the interest of the child so if the interest of the child from the convention we can take the global formulation of human rights of children it's a three e's one is the education second is the empowerment and the third is the entertainment so if we take these three in terms of empowerment there are a whole lot of other rights and which also means that there is a corresponding duty with everybody parents school community and education is a particular right where all of us have collective responsibility when it comes to entertainment it becomes child's own right for emancipation so in all these principles we have best interest of the child if it is not beneficial to the child don't engage in that research or teaching or intervention if you have to always weigh our ethical decision making is weighing the harms against the benefits the risks against the benefits so protect the child from harm never compromise the safety and well being of the child that's why we had to give up deeper questioning with the human trafficking offenders i mean victims or survivors participation of children we need to record it and we have to listen to them there is nothing wrong in going back to the child and asking child to participate and giving ideas obligation to prevent their harm and suffering the duty is always there therefore if we are interviewing we should make counseling and complimentary services to be available we should not say you give me this information i'll give you 10 rupees that's going to be uh, uh, corrupting children so with children showing them that kind of temptation and uh, corrupting their minds is uh, becoming a huge violation of uh, this obligation towards children now one of the very disturbing settings we have seen is child soldiering child soldiering not only happens in war zones and other places it may happen even in unorganized rebellious groups it may be just in the neighborhood of our own states uh, where uh, uh, extreme groups may be working so in such settings also i'll tell you the obligation that uh, uh, eric guidelines talk about suppose you have encountered a child soldier who is ridden with ak47 as a soldier you are not supposed to uh, fi fire the first bullet what if that child fires the bullet because these children are drugged and brainwashed and things like you have to take the bullet you can't use the uh, gun against the child i mean this is very strict rule Uh, ethical obligation and most of our honorable soldiers follow that all over the world because uh, the organized groups are ruthless uh, who are illegal but then the army when it acts it is supposed to capture the child as much as possible and bring back the child therefore planning following these institutional responsibilities and then also whenever we are working as organizations always avoid the conflict of interest in funding don't go to your own family's child because you are receiving the funding the power relation with children are very important avoid the teachers i always avoid teachers in giving data and uh, also while publishing acknowledge these uh, children's contribution but keep their names anonymous these days you know when we report crimes etc uh, there was a, there was a kind of licentious way in which media report media used to report now our courts have made it an offense even to declare uh, not only children even women you know their names etc so this trend has come in post 2013 uh, the nirbhaya scenario so there is a lot of sensitivity and uh, awareness in that regard so uh, in in case of children we have to do a thorough review uh, in planning and execution and take the informed consent if child is participating and don't publish assess the impact of publication i had seen one news item when i was uh, before i joined symbiosis and uh, this uh, child rape survivor was being uh, given a big scholarship in a in a district and they uh, published it everywhere i wrote a protest to that editor because i felt that revealing her name as a beneficiary and for their publicity was so harming compared to the ends of any utility that it was going to serve she was being uh, her own identity and her own inner uh, identification and value could be under risk when you publish like this and uh, uh, you should conduct research in underage children or uh, you should expose them only if that method is appropriate for them if it is to be provided only by children then only you talk to the child otherwise always talk to others who are involved in the situation only if your research is providing for all such safety conditions and you follow up and if the uh, i mean usually information is obtained by parent or guardian 
sometimes from the school, but not the child and that person together because that may harm the child. And if the child is able to express, you call the child. In courts also, we follow the same process. If the child is able to express, child is asked. Now, in case of healthcare also, we have had this uh, huge challenge in case of COVID-19 and uh, even in other cases, there's a lack of uniformity in the ethical guidelines. That's why we make it a factor in terms of our ethics committees and other places to look at vulnerable sections uh, with a lot of care. And Indian uh, guidelines are very clear on this. Our national ICMR guidelines are very clear on this. Now, I won't go deep into that because this is a mixed group. So I am uh, looking at close relationship between vulnerability and justice. Justice as in distribution of everybody's interest and right and protection and problem solving and uh, uh, creating a kind of correction if there is any violation of anybody's right. And that being more emphasized in case of children. So vulnerability in such a situation becomes a most, I mean, strictest kind of factor to look at this and uh, to take special care. We have also seen in uh, 2021 research uh, that a systematic analysis of European Court of Human Rights judgment says healthcare professionals in case of pediatrics need a special awareness of social, legal and ethical circumstances of patient situation and with increased risk of marginalization in the post-COVID and refugee, you know, a lot of exodus of refugee to Europe as well. So in all this light, I will uh, once again revisit this interacting law uh, with the vulnerable, national minority, stateless. So United Nations has projected these guidelines and all our countries are members to this, more than, more than 192 countries in the world. But if you're looking at from children's point of view, United Nations conventions or Convention on the Rights of Children in 1989, you know, they say that anti-racism convention came way back in the 60s and against women it came in 70s and for children it had to wait for three decades in 1989. Children are most vulnerable compared to the adults because they can't even uh, understand. I mean, if uh, I have read uh, discourses on how when a child is abused, the child always feels it is child's fault and child cannot express as well because child is overwhelmed by that experience and child gets confused if it is invasion or if it is affection. So children, if you look at children, they are no more the objects. They are now subjects of the law and children we can see as subjects in education in the school, in the community, in homes, in research and in uh, treatment and in uh, general health setting. I have uh, generally told about this, but now let me particularly travel you through how children are vulnerable in different situations. For example, the very definition of the child, what is child to one is not a child to other, unfortunately in our world. When it comes to marriage, 16 years is passed off as age of consent or simply attaining puberty is passed off as age of consent for marriage. Now, we have had a judgment in India, independent thought judgment, where Supreme Court judge pointed out that this kind of sanctioning of underage marriage could be violating the human rights of that person as a child, because a child is entitled to education. At that age, a child is the mother of three children, and she has not seen much of the world. Her self-actualization or pursuit of happiness, you were talking about Constitution Day and America's uh, Independence Day celebration, there's no better occasion than this to think of this vulnerable section. So that child's freedom is curtailed in the name of cultural invasion like marriage and uh, a compulsion to mother or parent the child. So this is where uh, a child's situation becomes vulnerable. When it comes to law, the law, when it comes to contractual arrangements in the business sense law says 18 years for the age of consent. And then when the child is not with the parents, but under the court appointed guardian, it becomes 21. So there is no uniform definition of child in the law itself. This creates multiple opportunities for vulnerability of children and their harm and their suffering, as I gave you the case of marriage. Let me give you a second example where uh, parents are career oriented and one parent, both parents are living together. And then there is a clash because both want to pursue their career aggressively. And at the early stages, the child is very dependent on the mother and the mother tries to balance, juggle the career and uh, marriage and then and the child. 
and parenting and then the father doesn't want to give any kind of cooperation he just pursues his own dream and goes to live in a, an area which takes a four hour flight to reach this uh, child in case of uh, any kind of emergency and finally they go to the court seek a divorce and when they seek the divorce the custody of the child becomes an issue and during the custody battle uh, which sometimes prolongs if both the parents are not seeing child in the center but their own ego in the center and child is the factor who is most important because of the sensitivity and nowadays in india and elsewhere in the world this whole idea of alienation of the non custodial parent causing some kind of psychological harm to the child with the medical evidences is being taken seriously fortunately in india also visitation by the alienated parent is considered as the right of the child and the right of that parent as well it should never be mixed with the maintenance or what we call alimony battle so these are separate categories of rights if you put child in the center such custody battles could be healed fortunately in india we have the model of court called family court which is looking at reconstructing and co-creating the family in case of a dispute by trying to emphasize these rights and some of our judgments are amazing our male i mean family courts are mandatorily having female judges and uh, i was talking to a close friend of mine who underwent a very bad uh, divorce battle and his whole struggle for protecting his right as a father was was very very difficult as far as us was concerned but if you look at indian courts because of india's over emphasis on family which is there in us as well but the way in which judicial mechanism needs to be sensitive to this mandatory counseling and after that judges being more sensitive you know this is something that is required in such case of battles where the child's right is put in the center and the disturbance that child goes through now child in a family if you look at child in the context of family a stressed family where who looks after the child and child may miss the parental love and uh, in this case what happened we had this interesting case in india a career woman finally wanting to take uh, sole custody of the child she did not want to name the father uh, as the other parent and she uh, had to put uh, her own name as a nominee i mean her own name and child as her nominee this was challenged and finally the supreme court appreciated that in such cases a single woman can or single parent can always nominate her child as the nominee without the consent or mention of the husband now uh, the, these situations are new situations of realizing child in the center of law another question that comes is who has the custody who is what is custody custody is about keeping and caring anything that is taken lawfully so in the cases of family the legal authority and duty of care in case of such parents is to be given by the court so sometimes court may appoint the guardian in case that child is abandoned or in case that child is not having biological parents or has incapacity or disability most of the time property cases uh, cases involving property may bring such cases to the court to be appointed as guardian or even under our personal law in india we have different kinds of personal law which may not be very much required here to be discussed but a child's upbringing a child's emotional need a child's financial need giving quality education to the child maintaining the property of the child and protecting that property from non interference by others becomes the duty of such parent or guardian who is legally given such right either in the case of divorce or death of another parent or any kind of crisis that family goes through so i wanted you all to understand this because as social workers and psychiatric advisors you may have to be very very sensitive to this and never involve in such situations unless you bring the child as a privy to the conversation and try to understand and child has to be factored in in such conversations now under prevention of domestic violence act a woman who is i mean this act is completely tilted towards women and uh, nowadays uh, same sex partnership also is being brought within this so temporary custody can be given to the child and uh, if there is any wrongful confinement by one of the parents then the parent the other parent can go to the high court and seek such custody under this legislation and there can be a criminal case in the magistrates court if such wrongful confinement is witnessed now coming to adoption a child can be given up for adoption for the institutions or uh, to the willing parents and such children have to be given up for adoption only after child welfare committee passes its resolution it declares it as free for adoption even non hindus can adopt 
and children should be orphaned abandoned or they should be uh, uh, they should be surrendered saying that there is no custodian so many a times i mean i myself had an experience of a, a, a preterm baby being abandoned in a dustbin in the bus stand and uh, we took her to the intensive care unit and from there after 10 days she survived and then we had to surrender her to a home after cwc report so many a times uh, such situations come and in case of forced abortions uh, selective abortions or abortion after the deadline because sometimes young children become pregnant because of crimes and things like that so right of such unborn child also is taken into consideration nobody can force an abortion medical termination of pregnancy is the one which is allowed so medical opinion is very important as far as the infant's health and mother's health now uh, convention on the rights of the child at the international level has become the standard setting document oh. around which national legislations have been passed so two types of national legislations or national treatment is there in india one is child in care or in need of care and protection and the other is child who children who are in conflict with the law so we have a juvenal justice act and some dimensions of child care and protection comes as part of the custody and family law as i discussed so in the convention on the rights of children or rights of the child in 1989 the focus issue was health care education legal and civil matters looking at child as an individual as a member of the family and community his or her best interest as the primary consideration so if you look at these uh, conventions definition of the child as 18 under the convention but i told you that it is something that is subject to lot of variation across the world due to the culture religion etc non discrimination best interests of the child child's right to be made real family guidance guidance as child develops life right to life of the child its survival his development name and nationality every child has a right to a name and nationality now in surrogate children this problem comes sometimes people commission surrogate children in gujarat it happened we have a famous popular movie called mimi which takes some of these issues american couple coming and commissioning and then abandoning because they go separate ways we it was uh, the movie was not about american actually it is a, a japanese couple who did this so in that case a child has a right to nationality a child cannot be abandoned in such a case depending on the situation the government can always take an action through the court of law and the police identity a child has a right to identity a child has to be um, having the experience of keeping families together contact with parents even if they are across countries protection from kidnapping respect for child's views that's what i was talking about and freedom of thought and religion sharing thoughts freely setting up or joining groups a child can join groups uh, protection of privacy access to information but qualified under the parental guidance responsibility of parents under uh, article 18 and there are many other things so overall the three e's i told you emancipation empowerment entertainment education protection from exploitation children in detention also have certain rights uh, unfortunately for us what happened if you look at the schools is the school uh, creating an educated adult what is the role of the school what is the current approach in curriculum and in assessment what is the role of teachers are the teachers being only facilitators or mentors or are they being authoritative should the learners be facilitated to choose learning pathways based on their interest ability and approaches to learning how many schools have this should there be should the differentials be honored in the school i always do such workshops with teachers and uh, how should a child be treated by other institutions like intervening social worker or parents how should they be do we look at differentials of children honored and differentiators defined for example i come from a family of total four so my three siblings are very different to me and uh, uh, whatever you expect from one child or whatever one child exhibits cannot be the standard setting rule for other children do we allow such differentials as parents do we respect it as a school and as a community organization or as a counselor how should schools and parents deal with special needs we have a famous movie uh, tare zameen par i don't know how many of you watch how did the parents deal with the need of that child how was the father and how was the mother and how was the school also abandoning him disowning him lonely till the art teacher recognizes him 
So child's right to social, emotional, and academic growth, enhancement of the sense of self of the child, and what could be the positive and negative impact of our conduct with that child? How do we make our environment child safe and conducive to development for the child? Now, this uh, research, which I gathered way back for a workshop on teachers, said that by 2025, India is poised for better growth. But two years uh, later, we had some problem. We, you know, the COVID-19 has uh, swung back our possibilities. It is going to decelerate, means to make it slower. Nevertheless, what we have is grueling issues of inclusion and vulnerability. Every two out of three school children face corporal punishment or psychological aggression. It's not always physical, it can be psychological aggression. So if you look at the role of India, uh, the way in which uh, our schools have to be transformed in encouraging innovators, original thinkers and entrepreneurs, we have a long way to go. And then you not only encourage that genius child, you look at uh, what uh, Rachel Nugent said, uh, in a global world, how do you see this youth, their dropout rate, knowledge and skill gap, health awareness, for example, Jilla Panchayat school children and their uh, skill acquisition and children from the uh, public schools, I mean, uh, rich private schools, how do they, I mean, I have done this research in 21st century skill, uh, this one, what we lack is teaching children to take initiative. Uh, we discourage rather, we say, you listen to me. We don't like questioning children. Jay Krishnamurti said, teach them to question. So in NABI and uh, behavioral issues in ADHD, et cetera, what they said was that there are many issues which need uh, attention. For example, poor vocabulary, market-centric approach. I mean, buying and buying behavior and all of that. So uh, we, we see that there is a long way to go. We have to look at uh, in terms of such a world, uh, child-centric jurisprudence, where we look at child-centric theory of rights and uh, how do we improve the outcome of law, outcome of our organization and practice for children. That should be the focus. So in the Kids' Rights Index in 2021, our country does not fare well. It's um, next to Philippines and it's 112th rank. So it's a very sad reality and best interest of the child rights principle has been taken as a very dynamic, flexible, lax concept. Therefore, right to life, right to health, right to education, right to protection and enabling environment for children's rights is something when it is taken as a parameter by Erasmus University of Europe, we saw that we have not been so fast. Therefore, child's personality, child's talent, child's mental and physical abilities, his uh, uh, and her human rights, fundamental freedoms, respect for own parents, culture, language, national values, and responsible child in a free society with the understanding, peace, tolerance, equality of success, friendship with the different dimensional schools or multi, we say multi-denominational schools. So these are very important. And uh, child should respect ecocentric values, development for uh, respect for environment. So these are the educational rights of the children articulated here. So if you are looking at these concepts, we have had India's new education policy and child right education approach under the UNICEF, and we have National Commission for Protection of Children's Rights as well. So uh, national child rights education is a kind of arch of rights where child has the right and we all have the duty and it is through the child and for the child and about the child and it is for the rights of children. Now, if you look at Indian constitution, it has articulated it. Our Joinal Justice Act of 2015 talks of these two types of children and how government should be acting. Currently, our Child Protection Commission is very, very proactive. Street children have been in focus, other children have been focused, interventions have been happening. Even our judges and courts, number of cases we have come across, like recently there was a case of two daughters being, motherless daughters being raped by the father reported to the court. And the court uh, was looking at harshest of the punishment and it went, uh, it elaborated, the judges elaborated on how a protector turns out to be a monster and the children were crying silent tears. And finally it came, and whenever they resisted, there was other types of violence, which was, which they were met with. And usually in such cases, either a neighbor or a passing by person 
or a, a domestic servant or any help or a lift person and other people become the witnesses so if you look at india's uh, uh, another dangerous situation is that child care institutions as ngos also please be careful in this because even in these issues we need to be very very careful some of the provisions of the act uh, need to be uh, strictly followed because there is no proper ratio between child and caregiver less number of social workers in these protection homes non establishment of grievance redressal mechanism prevalence of harsher methods i had one of my colleagues uh, who underwent this uh, terrible experience of being separated from her child because of custody battle father abducted the child without telling her so there was a protracted uh, legal battle and the child was put in the care home when the child came back her head full filled with lies and uh, she also narrated how she was beaten many a times which she and the other girls used to beat her so uh, which shows that institutionalization is not the best solution foster care combined care and frequent visit of parents and also uh, earlier earliest disposal of cases in case of children is very important the harsher method should be replaced so if you look at the statistics also look at the profiles of the children who are there now this is a big agenda for people like dr radhakar uh, total number of children 3 lakh 77000 children of single parent 1 lakh 20000 that means our families falling apart really affects children orphans 41000 abandoned 7000 surrendered 6700 sexually abused 1000 victim of child pornography very interesting 189 domestic work trafficking trafficking for labor about 2600 in total boys are trafficked for labor girls are tra- even among women and men also girls for commercial sex uh, Uh, exploitation child marriage victims again see 469 homeless children 8000 opening 8500 this is despite the work of people like kailash satyarthi you know so uh, those who go to the state homes mentally challenged children 10000 that means families do not want to have children who are mentally challenged i have seen this situation we have intervened physically challenged children 9000 so as much as uh, men the physical health care <coughs> my appeal to doctors is that mental health care needs to be particularly focused in terms of attention and education to families is required that such children uh, and there needs to be harsher kind of treatment by the law also for such parents i mean if it comes to the attention of the courts they don't spare them the judges don't spare them it is i think the lack of bringing it to the attention of the law who why for me kind of attitude you know so a kind of legal fund allocation by these ngos is very important to espouse the cause of these vulnerable population who don't have a voice of their own i had come across a case where i was collaborating with an ngo in my hometown where one girl who was a domestic help she was given as a domestic help with lump sum money by these couple doctor couple and they used to lock her in the house and they would uh, always such a small girl 8 year old girl and she used to cry in the night this was heard by a neighbor one of the retired professors who brought it to our attention and then we got the, them booked and then the girl was narrating how they would make her wash huge bed sheets because hand wash is better than the machine wash look at the luxury and then they never cared about educating her never cared about her health both being doctors i have come across case in chenpatna taluka uh, so there is a kannada documentary on that today is the child in de balya which was a unicef documentary which talked about thousands of children being sold to the silk industry because when the cocoon is to be taken it has to be taken with nimble hands and uh, children have to put their hand deep down in the boiling water and remove the cocoon if you look at the hands of those children the top layer is peeled off but they become resistant over a period of time for 6000 7000 a year these children are kept their education gone to the docks and then what do parents do with this money they go and have a nice biryani go to movies so parenting education family education there's a huge agenda there uh, with the uh, what we see in legal aid you know the legal aid services authority act which talks about different categories of people 80% of india is coming within that less of family orientation kind of uh, economic and social bracket where because of poverty a good meal and other things they forget about their obligation and affection for the children 
so uh, in vulnerability of children who are kept in or children in conflict with the law in various times uh, types of homes and kinship care when that statistics which i told you was brought before the court supreme court so justice nageshwar rao and justice deepak gupta had this to say they gave whole lot of measures regarding child welfare committee juvenal justice board government child care institution protective measure and also specific guidance regarding the well being of the child in need of protection and children in conflict with the law children in conflict are those who are into stealing and other things our own punekar sheila barse filed series of cases about these children who are caught in the train and other particularly boys and how they were beaten by the police and all that stopped after a series of sheila barse cases so children as players in the justice system in our society in community and not as pawns is important therefore i urge this audience to go through all these legislations and higher reading and then i suggest that there are best practices across the world for example in finland the motto is happy child in europe human rights in education is part of the teacher training and kids training and parents training we should give parental workshops in uk excellence in education in uh, in us in us we have had hundreds of cases where children uh, uh, reticent to follow the norm were uh, bullied by other children and this has been harshly handled i mean firmly handled by the school and if the school has been silent then the courts and the educational authorities have handled these schools as well in india we had a very interesting case the jehova witness case where the children refused to sing the national anthem because it goes against their belief system and then uh, the school authorities uh, in a way suspended the children and when they approached the court the court said that for a country like india uh, tolerance also includes right to silence i mean they did not protest they did not insult they were only silent therefore freedom of speech and expression includes right to silence so children's attitude was not decried as a kind of disrespect but rather they said that as a nation and as a culture we are tolerant and it's a plurality of belief systems so uh, we have parents forum as well which we need to strengthen in india many a times courts wisdom has come to the rescue and then uh, what i would request you is go through these sample readings which i have suggested so overall what do we want to achieve we want to achieve democratic emancipation for india and for the world blend of creativity art information child having that pride you know in sense of achievement sense of caring sense of service sense of self sports daily living lifelong learning sense of community and environment thinking skills and most of all science and technology so when we look at it such education is a key driver but um, what's most important is the outcome framework in terms of child care and child rights which is safety education and health as objective child defined outcome in terms of well being and child centric goals as i told you social care environment which is we intervene only when needed at the level that is needed we don't keep quiet and services to be respectful of child humane to the child rights based approach and family functioning and uh, parental capacity to be enhanced probably your ngo has a lot of role social workers have a lot of role in a very i mean we had a family education center in mangalore it made lot of difference to the communities client defined outcomes you know second generation children going to google and other places first generation generation as lay per single parents this could be achieved only because of such intervention there's a lot of shaping we have to do and workforce outcome in terms of stable employment or state support and well supported staff when the single parent works the organization has to be mindful of such supports cost effectiveness of these things in terms of child care you know free child care or cost effective child care or community care in uh, holland that's what started an okle when she spoke about gendered role in terms of feminism and gender equality she spoke of how mothering or parenting is not single person's wish you are doing it for the whole humanity so that understanding should come in terms of crash facilities now we, now i will give you some stories one is one child constantly complains of peer bullying principal talks to that bully student but the child gets depressed and withdraws after a month so what is the approach here child complains of sexual harassment by a teacher principal takes 3 days to take an action parents protest so how would you respond to such a situation 
Then a child has come to this case we dealt in Symbiosis Law School. A child complains about bus conductor molesting her, school ignores, parents file police case of rape, public go on a rampage, then the conductor is arrested and the school expels the girl. How do you deal with that? We dealt in a different way. A low scoring student in discipline shows bruise marks of parental beating. Low scoring student in discipline shows the bruise marks. Neighborhood school boy, text messages and befriends. Later, a Facebook posting of outing with your student or ward is reported by friends. How would you react? Not so neatly dressed student who is slow in studies is pushed by you with harsh words as a teacher or social worker saying untidy when she comes near you. Is that emotional harassment? Uh, so how do you deal with your student or ward's success? Are you overwhelmed? And what about another student or ward who is unsuccessful? How do you define success? Is the school success or so-called success the success? That's what Jay Krishnamurti asked. And what is the need for homeschool collaboration in child's well-being? And how does the school react if the child has a strained family, like the bruises on the body? Interventions made in child's life. If you have any example of any of you having made intervention in child's life beyond the calling of your profession by exercising the goodwill and your good office. Doctors have plenty of goodwill in the community. Social workers have plenty of knowledge and mechanisms and skills in relation to this. So how do we do that so that a child leads a happy, harassment-free, child-friendly, ethical, and effective school and community and family life? So over to the organizers, thank you one and all. Uh, I have given my references. These references are not difficult to obtain. It, it is all available in Google. Some of them are special articles in some journals. Thank you once again, over to you. I'll just keep that slide open where I have raised those uh, problems for your reflection. Just, yeah, over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very good information. And um, I love the fact that you are taking vulnerability as an opportunity. And, uh, you know, I mean, not taking in a negative context and then making it, and there is so many issues like this and so many, so much work to be done. It is kind of overwhelming actually. <clears throat> not only that we see so many, I think the numbers that you presented, those are national numbers of abuse. And I yeah. think they're underestimated numbers. They are. I feel they, uh, if, I mean, I could just put that one town and give, I mean, it's hugely underestimated what I feel it. Um, we are just such a small organization and we are seeing so many issues and uh, so many, um, I wouldn't even call problems, so many things that can be done. We're, so as a nonprofit organization who's uh, at a, is functioning abroad and not on site, what do you think we, we could do as a nonprofit, as a guidance, because you are there on the ground, and what do you think we could do? Uh, what would be some of the recommendations from your end? So one of the recommendations is uh, creating a checklist of uh, children's rights as we proposed in this presentation, and then seeing uh, in your access point or in interaction, in a very skillful way, if there is any endangerment to this right in the families who approach you, in the community that you approach. So that could be intervention. But generally, awareness itself is the first step to transformation. So creating such literacy drives, focus group discussions, and inviting such problems or cases, and having a multi-expertise panel resource network could be the third step. So these are the three suggestions I thank you. I completely agree because we are seeing, I mean, education at the parent level level also, you said we, we also see huge need in that. We are not doing a good job of, especially we have so much diversity in India, language barriers are there, cultural barriers are there. A lot of the education and higher knowledge is available in English. Yeah. And the penetration into the regional language and the local language is just so much needed for empowerment and education so they know the right. What are the, the nonprofit organization that they're, uh, they, they need a lot of, I think, these awareness and education because they're dealing with this vulnerable population. 
in India also. I'm talking about the um, so training the trainer could training. be hmm. training the trainer and those trainers intervening in schools in communities and uh, them finally training another group. So it can be a chain reaction in the given area. You can choose a small uh, what we call as pilot group. Uh, in a community pilot region and then you start experimenting and I completely agree with you that uh, the diversity that India has in multiple levels will require these ideas to be translated into local languages we used to do something called paralegal training in some way recently we did uh, with a very remote community with women who were just six standard and they had children who were doing very well in schools and careers because of the intervention by an NGO through Aga Khan Palace Foundation. So uh, a lot of such work is quietly happening, but with the outcome oriented work, with a clear agenda, time bound uh, delivery, uh, these are the few things you could do in a matter of one year and study what works the best and focus on that. And then move to another community because it becomes self-sustaining. And intervention mm. in schools, in parent-teacher meetings could be a very good intervention because parent-teacher meeting always has an educative session you could have a workshop there because many parents may not be aware that this perspective exists because we in India, we have a very hierarchical family structure and uh, parents and children don't even look eye to eye in some of the families. Maybe my generation, our generation didn't have that. I mean, we as parents are doing better because we are exposed to do, thanks to the internet and other things. But our parents' generation treated us with that hierarchy. So many who have not been exposed in remote areas, etc., may pass on the same. There's nothing wrong, but if they're mindful of child, I mean, they talk about Gopala Krishna or goddess, Bal goddess, when uh, the child is a child in a very theoretical sense, but translating it into real life way is missing. So our conjectures yeah. need to be lifetime practices. So, yeah. um, I just want to ask if audience has any question please do not uh, name the child. Um, if you're going to ask question uh, about a particular child or something in reference to any particular case, do not name that, please. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand and then I will put, um, uh, will get you on the screen and then unmute yourself and ask the question. Hindi may be aap bol sakte na? Hindi may be aap question pooch sakte ho? Yeah, I'm So, agar Hindi may pooch pooch na hai. So, Vandana has a question. Ji. Thank you, Dr. Gurpur. First of all, uh, very informative and uh, eye opening session for me. One thing that uh, uh, caught my attention was the mention of having an ethical advisor. Uh, when you are working with vulnerable population, the nonprofit organizations, NGOs, working with these uh, uh, vulnerable population, and you have given, you know, really very effective guidelines also, a lot of data is there, information is there, but this having this ethical advisor, um, is that a recommendation? Or I was wondering, is it actually, um, uh, you know, a, a requirement in India by the uh, uh, judicial uh, side or the, um, you know, the rules for an NGO in India. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, actually, it's not a requirement. It's a not a mandatory legal requirement. It is rather my recommendation, as you rightly said. Mm -hmm. okay, in India, uh, we don't have a structured ethical guideline for any human operation except in medical field. Yeah, you know, Indian Council for Medical Research is the one. And now slowly universities are developing because for international funding, they ask for ethics committees and things like that, other than medical profession. So when I was doing this work, as I told you, for policy formulation, I did not have single ethical guideline as far as India was concerned, except Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's project in India with the National AIDS Council. We saw that ethical guideline and then we saw the ICMR guideline. So why the guideline is the question. If it is not, should we do things only if law mandates? Should we not avert any risk? And should we not do our duty to the highest possible, uh, highest possible standards? Then uh, studying ethics on our own and keeping those mindfulness is important. Most of the doctors have it as part of the curriculum. Nurses have it as part of the curriculum. Social workers have it as part of the curriculum. We lawyers also have uh, professional ethics. 
so those professionals who, who haven't studied it will never bother otherwise that is why i suggested and uh, what is the advantage i told you we become sensitive we become responsible we avert any kind of risk we will be taking very considered decision so how, where do you get these advisors from you can find them among the doctors you can find them among the social workers legal professionals that is why now every organization has got an internal complaints committee to avert sexual harassment in india it's mm -hmm. mandatory if you have more than 10 employees So yes, thank you. Know, Madam, in terms of research and activity, you can take these generic guidelines of ICMR and uh, you can echo uh, National AIDS Coun Council and uh, you or you can have a doctor on your board. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, it's a very important, uh, even though it came as a recommendation, actually it is so important, so vital that uh, uh, it... Um, you, you know, the, the organizations themselves should make it a certain kind of rule to have somebody on board like that because the, uh, just to protect the, the children and the, the vulnerable population there. Thank you. I remember during COVID wave one, there was a YouTube interview of one of the eminent uh, uh, international lawyers, Philip, uh, uh, I mean, he's from uh, UK. And uh, he's an important uh, jurist invited by United Nations organization as well. He was asked a question by one uh, researcher. Uh, if there is any COVID probe, post-COVID probe, and uh, there is a liability to be fixed, what kind of international committee should be there? He said, a person with highest integrity and ethical responsibility should lead that committee. So ethics is everything because it defines the choices and it also, it doesn't prevent your choices, but it defines and gives you the opportunity to calibrate or deliberate on those choices. You can make a choice to harm, you can make a choice to avert harm. Choice is yours. But then it is the one which gives you that point of ethics, we always say, is not the destination, it is a journey because destination may be determined by financial viability, the debts you may have, the other obligations you may have. But that journey of going through that choice is very important because it educates you on aggressive greed and other things. Yeah. Um, just as you know, the ethics is such a based on your own belief, biases can impact your ethics. Um, which causes harm, which society and people do not know also. Uh, the underlying why... bills by... Sorry, there was a brief yeah. interruption. That's why yeah. I say that let's not go by personal ethics, because in a professional mm. program, there is a structured ethical guideline, as I said, ICMR guideline. So take mm. or NACO guideline, or we have United Nations ERIC guideline, which I gave you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Meenal has a question. Meenal? Yeah, please. Yeah. My question was that Bharat, especially in uh, underprivileged society, uh, alcoholism is one of the major issues. And we have seen that we have been in a lot of places where people come to the house at night and drink their husband. In underprivileged society, mein, the houses are not big enough. There is a room or two rooms, so everything is in front of the children. Which affects them very badly. Yeah. But this is not the So, why do you think that this is a common practice? If mm. a uh, husband is a good person, then you have to say that he is a good person. And he is a good person. And he is a good person. So, when he is a good person, then naturally uh, we want to take them ahead in education. But mm -hmm. these emotional issues, ki se, they cannot grasp it or concentrate on their studies. Mm -hmm. So in such a situation, we 
क्या रोल प्ले कर सकते हैं द फैक्ट दैट यू आर आप ऐसे स्टूडेंट्स को एक्सेप्ट करते हैं ना वही आपका बड़ा स्ट्रेंथ है वो स्टूडेंट्स को अपने घर के टॉक्सिसिटी से बाहर फ्रेश एयर आपके साथ मिलता है बट uh, आप पे पढ़े होंगे कि डब्ल्यू एच ओ अभी एडिक्शन को मेंटल हेल्थ का एक डायमेंशन बोल के माना है और uh, uh, ये मेंटल हेल्थ का अवेयरनेस अगर बच्चों को मिलता है तो दे डेवलप उनको अपने फादर से नफरत नहीं होगा मदर के बारे में नाराज नहीं होंगे वो वो समझने का ट्राई करेंगे और उनको मेंटली स्ट्रांग बनाने का हीलिंग प्रोसेस नहीं हमने तो, अक्सर ये देखा है कि बच्चे नफरत नहीं करते हैं शराबी से क्योंकि जब भी वो आ, होश में रहता है तो एक्चुअली मतलब माँ से भी ज्यादा शराबी बाप बच्चों को ज्यादा क्लोज रहता है तो हम तो ये देखा है कि बच्चे कभी भी शराबी को हेट नहीं करते नफरत नहीं करते हैं बच्चे किसी को नफरत नहीं करते बच्चे हाँ। अपने आ, हमने ये पढ़ा है कि शराबी ड्रग एडिक्ट फादर इवन ब्रेक इन द बोन्स ऑफ द चिल्ड्रन वो बच्चा स्लिंग में रहता है फादर आते ही हक करता है उस स्लिंग के साथ वो स्लिंग का कारण उसका फादर है ऐसे बच्चे लेकिन हमारी अंडरस्टैंडिंग जो मैंने पढ़ा है आई एम नॉट एक्सपर्ट इन दैट फील्ड मेंटल हेल्थ एक्सपर्ट्स आपके साथ ऐसे बच्चों को वो एक्सपीरियंस से बाहर ला पॉजिटिव डायरेक्शन पे ले जा सकते क्योंकि बच्चे अगर हंस के खेल के रहते इसका मतलब वो ठीक है बोल के नहीं है उसके उनका ऊपर सुपरफिशियली उन्होंने बाम लगाया है प्यार का बट अंदर वो उंड हिल नहीं हुआ है तो उसके लिए उनको स्पेशलाइज्ड पर्सनलाइज्ड काउंसलिंग डिटॉक्सिफिकेशन मेंटल डिटॉक्सिफिकेशन प्रोसेस हॉस्टल में रहने का इंतजाम घर के माहौल को ठीक करने का इंटरवेंशन आप कर सकते हैं क्या उनके कंसेंट के बिना आप कर नहीं सकते हस्बैंड का या वाइफ का बट उनको आप इस सिचुएशन में कोप करने का मैकेनिज्म से दिस आई थिंक स्पेशलिस्ट विल टेल यू अबाउट दैट तो एक ऐसे स्पेशलिस्ट को आप एडवाइजरी में रखिए ऐसे केसेस को कैसे हैंडल करना एक प्रोसेस बना दीजिए ओके थैंक यू आफ्टर स्कूल एक्टिविटीज भी आप लगा सकते हैं ऐसे बच्चों को we we are dealing with few children like this actually uh with the family and uh, uh, you know this the cases uh, some of our cases are pretty much similar to this mm. um and uh, we can uh, you know see the trauma mm. even the alcoholic person has a trauma and the mental illness that's why they are so it becomes very like that alcoholic person also is dealing with the trauma yeah in a way of drinking alcohol the judgments are impaired and then the whole family is tangled into it there is this abuse and uh, ptsd and when you trying to like what you're saying uh, it becomes a bit um uh, very juggling very complex issue because taking the child away from the parent is also creating huge amount of trauma trauma <laughs> as she said not- ha huh. as she so said you know, that parent is very loving when he is not under the influence of alcohol he is able to connect better than probably the, than the other parent other parent can't connect when she is half stressed with this <laughs> so it's an yeah, internal yeah. cycle of misery so somewhere that cycle has to be broken by giving them coping mechanisms outside of his by extended family school after school activity creating a good discipline for peer group i like this like exposing yeah, them to know. reading and uh, uh, entertainment yeah. processes which are possible i think that's true yeah right uh, there is a comment i think in today's world social media plays a huge role and almost everyone has a social media platform and nowadays people are sharing their trauma on social media so is that a good thing for children or is that something um that needs to be looked after i mean i would say legal yeah this is more medical okay so the social media and the on the that's what the question is about yeah see i always uh, answer such questions on the basis of my media law understanding in media mm. we had earlier a censorship concept Uh, i mean in the conventional media we have a censorship concept and it was called 
you know, we had just Sita Itulla in K. Abbas case telling that movies can be having direct impact on the mind. Therefore, in case of movies, pre-censorship before it is released to the audience. Today, with the Netflix and uh, Prime videos and everything, all kinds of movies are uh, being released. Although, luckily, uh, self-regulation in terms of them declaring 18 plus, etc., is beamed on the screen, but in a tiny, tiny letter on the left hand side, because human eye always moves on the right hand side top. So, this is where parenting with that awareness is very important. First of all, parents not being addicts. Net, Netflix is easily addictive. And a lot of content is very harmful to the tender mind. So uh, we have in media studies something called, uh, uh, you know, uh, reducing the impact by educated watch. In educated watch, we say that parent discusses with the child what the child is going to watch and raises questions. It doesn't declare this is bad, this is good, but just says that there could be this scene, what do you think? So assess the capability of the child, understand the content in advance. If you have good open communication, no child will hide it from you. If a child is hiding, that means you're scaring that child, the child is scared of you. Uh, the child thinks that you are orthodox or you may not approve of the conduct. So if you show openness, then the child discusses and that nullifies the effect of that content. So social media awareness, social media education to your child with open communication, which presupposes a very open understanding, loving environment in the house, uh, which home, which we need to cultivate. Therefore, there are other factors. It's not social media alone. It is a devil, yes. It doesn't go through the check gate of censorship and things like that. But if my house is having strong door, how can the thief enter in? If my house has good alarm signals, I will be uh, strong enough to shield myself against the thief. What is happening now is our house doors are dilapidated, they are brittle. So all kinds of thieves and evils come in. So this is something we need to watch. So I think uh, this is, this is, I think uh, if we do, uh, this is going to be more, uh, what you call uh, self-regulation. You know, our students had a very interesting discussion during uh, our recent debates. Once we were talking about right to be forgotten on the social media means, you know, French started this when the Charlie Hebdo entire editorial team was decimated with this uh, sharpshooter terrorist. All the world media was writing about it, but France wanted Google to block this news because France did not want to live with that national memory. Within 24 hours, a new editorial team came and Charlie Hebdo continued because such was their commitment to freedom of speech and expression and resistance to any violation of that. So it, it is speaking about a very strong value, very refined uh, constitutional and human rights tradition. So right to be forgotten argued against this big data company not to publish this news and erase such news and so, so erase bad public memory, bad national memory. How many of us ask for it as individuals? So many a times we pay these uh, specialized technicians and we try to uh, eclipse it. Our students did a discussion, which I liked very much. They said, right to remain obscure. I should have a choice to prevent my data from being used by any commercial company or prevent my name by use being used by anyone without my consent, me being invited or given choices in Facebook of friends. I don't want that. I want to remain obscure. I want to use the social media or I may not want to use the social media. I might have used for some time and now I'm not making that choice. So respect me, don't aggressively push these things to me. So I feel until we become respectful of our own dignity, our own freedom, our own autonomy, and not become vulnerable. I told you, vulnerability is a relative concept. Today, all of us are vulnerable. As we are talking here, our personal data is being used by some business company. It is trying to see what kind of tastes and preferences we have. Do we want them to determine how we dress, how we think, how we feel? No, we have our ingenuity as thinking beings because that's why we are at the highest level of bio, uh, biological kingdom with that capacity to reason out. So this is the issue that our youngsters were talking and I felt very proud of these uh, students, you know, who had the entire debate on right to remain obscure. 
to switch off the data which I don't want anyone to see, to switch off my photo, to switch off my identity, because I don't want anyone to interfere with my being. So this kind of self-pride our youngster should take in what we call as rational choices they make in, in uh, we use a word, optimum use of social media, healthy use of social media. I'm not the person who is that orthodox to say switch off or deprive social media. Let it be there. There are good things happening through that. I learned so many ideas through such open democracy. We call it a semantic democracy, meaning making process of life and reality, procuring meaning, choosing meaning. There are good things. But I am empowered. I got this privilege when I turned 45, 50. So my awareness was built. But for the youngster, if we are able to do that process of dignity and self-respect, self-image, and the dangers of social media, because the minute I open my account, I may be chased by a pervert. I may be chased by a psychologist. I may be chased by an intelligence officer and all the more by the state surveillance, among other things. So uh, do I want to make myself vulnerable or am I discreet and educated and courageous enough to withdraw when I sense a danger to my being? So this is something wherever there is that sense of self-worth and uh, uh, pride of being a human persona, I don't think any media can corrupt us. Which is true and needs a lot of, um, that for that you need clarity though. Yeah, mental so clarity, I, mental clarity, yeah. and the peer pressure and these things to be withstood. So our homes and our uh, institutions, our socialization process, even the material we put before them, need to encourage this. I see that revival at least in small percentage. Yeah, I agree, agree, agree. Yeah, completely. I mean, we see a lot of. That's why we have a. You know, the once we started working, we realized so much trauma from these children, they're mentally blocked. So we have psychologists and psychiatrists, child adolescent psychiatrists, uh, and we have more emphasis on that. Our webinars are also based on that. And we try to do it in a regional language is more, uh, giving a sense of uh, hopefully some kind of opening pores and doors and being becoming more aware. And that's why we are also concentrating on that. Um, I did get, I mean, after this session also, I got a few ideas also. Um, a, any, I think we'll take last question and it's um, one and a half hour. If anybody has a last question regarding that, what the, what I'm realizing also nonprofit organizations have, uh, do not have a structure in place uh, and policies in place to protect themselves or the children, not on, not only protect themselves, but the rights of children. And then um, the marriage, child marriages, I'm seeing right and left in this sector of society. Uh, there is, a, I think the government increased the age of girl to 21. Yeah. Is that across? Uh, not many people are aware of that also. People are aware, they don't want to follow because they feel, okay. yeah. Sometimes in India, what happens is, the families are in such vulnerable socioeconomic condition. They feel a young grown up girl being at home and both the parents going out to work makes her more vulnerable to become pregnant and things like that. So they marry them off. But what oh. they don't realize is either way she is vulnerable. So more awareness. I mean, I was trying to educate our one of the women who used to help me in the domestic chores, but she was refusing to listen to me. She says, Aapko samajh mein nahi aega. So it is the it is the social vulnerability which needs to be improved with the law and order situation, proper use of technology, and then interdependence of communities also. How long you can fight with the neighborhood young man? He may bring his gang and make you more vulnerable. So there are multiple socioeconomic factors which need to be taken into uh, consideration here. Uh, yeah. I think uh, it's an evolution of uh, uh, a family. We call it social mobility. With the mobility only, it can improve. It's like, you know, uh, chicken or egg. Unless you are educated and you are migrating, your, your situation of vulnerability doesn't change. But uh, to be that, you have to be less vulnerable. So what comes first that is where um, role comes in 
in providing avenues of education i had one example i was doing this community based uh, research work in the first year of my career taking students to the village and proposing law reform for agrarian workers we visited one family and there a very beautiful smart girl was serving us sharbat in a thatched house her mother had gone and when she heard i had come she came cutting short her duty and then we asked uh, this girl i told her she had scored 80% in the 10th examination and she was not sent to school then i asked the mother she said uh, see I, i and she and uh, her brother lives in bombay now what do i do i said uh, see now when she is in the house at least my neighbors are there and i don't uh, i can't afford her education i said there are free education available nominal fee we can raise funds for her so all the kids and us we raised funds and we paid her uh, uh, equal amount for her 3 years college degree 2 uh, 2 plus 3 years a five year college degree and uh, she started traveling from the village to the city 16 kilometers and this girl uh, came first class and when she was in final year uh, when she was traveling by bus she met the local industrialist and now she is the md of that company so anybody's turning point comes if they are able to take such courageous decisions and we make those interventions and we educate these people not otherwise give them that moral courage and support that's true that's true uh maya i think has a question maya last question we will take maya ha ha okay unmute kar ha unmute kar ke ha ha ke le ke le unmute kara tumhi ke le hota 2 minute mi karte nahi ta हाँ बोला नमस्कार मी माया खरे एंड आई एम डायरेक्टली रिलेटेड टू वंदना एंड आई जॉइन दिस क्लास जस्ट फाइव मिनिट्स अगो बट वॉट एवर आई लिसन टिल नाउ आई कुड मेक आउट दैट वॉट एवर आई फेल्ट आई एम टेलिंग यू दैट वॉट वी टीच अवर चिल्ड्रन एंड पर्टिक्युलरली लेट इट बी अमेरिका इंडिया और एनी इस्लाम दैट इज मोर इम्पॉर्टेंट एंड टीचिंग टू चिल्ड्रन इज नॉट ओनली बाई स्कूल but like my i am a grandmother okay i live here in america for past 12 years mm. so i feel very comfortable directly with my grandchildren than my own kids i have two kids two sons and a daughter anuja they are all busy they are all working but my daughter she works from chicago she log in at 5 o'clock in the morning and she finishes her work by 2 o'clock in the afternoon she has got only one daughter and i was a banker in india worked for 37 in years in state bank of india with a big giant family but uh, i had a liking for books because when i was growing up there was no tv no telephone nothing and my parents used to be transferred he was also a banker and uh, i was staying alone in hyderabad because my father used to get transferred to rural places and uh, due to certain things i was a loner right from my childhood and the only company was either the small transistor or a books and i was not a tomboy i never used to play like my i have only one sister her name is chaya she is in india and she is a retired principal of a government school and i am a banker because my father was a banker and we had that, those very uh, special uh, privilege that they will just take a interview being a staff children i, I got the job i was smart in studies and uh, first appointment was in a very rural place zahirabad near karnataka so madam uh, uh, maya your maya so what i mean to say i married i was in a joint family and uh, i was the eldest but what i taught to my children in those days also is i used to gift the uh, geeta press books man those days 25 paise mein aisa aata tha mujhe hardi yeah. kunkal i don't know you understand marathi man आश्चर्य मैं भांडी दी डिफरंट वे ऑफ थॉट एंड नाउ डेज आई टेक हिंदी क्लासेस हियर मैम आई एम ए रिटायर्ड पर्सन आई लिव इन कैलिफोर्निया इन अ वेरी लग्जुरियस हाउस बट आई नो आई वॉन्टेड टू स्पेंड माई टाइम सो राइट फ्रॉम फोर ओ क्लॉक आई डू माई भगवद गीता एंड डिफरेंट थिंग्स टिल एट फिफ्टीन आई एम डन then whatever i do then 11:30 to 1:30 i'm busy teaching hindi in because now summer 
Uh, uh, sorry, so what we can do, you yeah. mean, we can impart being a grandmother to our grandkids because kids are busy. So if we do that, my Arjun, he's in Phoenix. He knows everything. He knows Hanuman Chalisa. He knows how to write yeah. Hindi. And that so way, this kind I of, think uh, can... Madam, I totally agree with you. This kind of sanskar, you know, of right and wrong, that's an ethical thing. Inspiration from our traditional values. See, Hanuman, one Hanuman, and uh, I was reading Sundar Kandu in my 40s. First time I realized what a rich literature it was. And the, and the internal dialogue of Hanuman when he sees Sita, and he could mm -hmm. simply capture her and take. But he says, no, it is not my battle. The way he draws boundaries for himself, the way he realizes his job description, his role. You know, there are so many things in our own culture which could come. Even uh, Mrs. Sudhamurthy talks about how she tells stories to her grandchildren. So I agree with you to summarize your whole reflection, yes. one sentence, our homes yes. have, be have to become more conducive to child's all-round growth. Thank you, ma'am. Over to Dr. Radha. Yeah. yeah. Ma'am, you are muted, I think. Yeah. Oh, okay, sir. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, really loved discussion. Now I'm feeling more responsibility, actually, after the session because of the nonprofit attachments and the, uh, the as a nonprofit founder, uh, that sense of uh, more responsibility uh, is on us. We are seeing all these things, uh, all the issues, and and then how do we tackle one at a time, maybe? Um, and uh, would love to have your guidance going forward also in some of the situations because we are seeing a lot of these. Um, issues and problems in uh, when we are even dealing with some of the situations with us, our um, uh, population, uh, children, organizations, we are attached to few organizations. Um, and then we'll do, deal with individual cases also. Um, and so really thank you for the audience also for sticking up for so long, taking time from your busy day and the long weekend that we have here also. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Guru, for special thank you to you uh, mm -hmm. for opening up this whole new world for us. And uh, thank you to Symbiosis uh, and uh, the team and the people who attended. Um, so um, your, uh, the, the, power, the PowerPoint, the presentation was also very broad uh, and gave a broader view on this topic, not just the uh, uh, you know, so that, uh, and then that just kind of, I just want to say that brings us more uh, responsibility actually uh, to do things. And there are lots of gaps uh, available. Um, I see it actually. Um, and then a lot of responsibility and a lot of uh, awareness and work to be done. Uh, we'll do one thing at a time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, to all of you. Good weekend. Enjoy your Independence Day. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.